Welcome to the Indie Women Podcast, where we introduce you to the fearless women taking their filmmaking careers into their own hands, showing you how indie films get made. And here's your host, Heather Turman. Welcome to the Indie Women Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Turman, and this is the very first episode. Uh, I am incredibly excited to be launching this podcast. I'm an independent filmmaker, a screenwriter, and a stand-up comic. I have 11 years of, of comedy under my belt. And so creating my own content has been a part of my career since the very beginning. And I feel that this the entire indie film landscape seems to be... Uh, Another boys club, just like regular old Hollywood, just like regular old comedy. Nothing but nothing but male filmmakers um, in the indie space seem to be highlighted all the time. And I wanted to change that. I wanted to create a podcast that would help introduce to the world and give a platform to women who are independent creators and uh, independent filmmakers who have have the the ovaries the balls the ovaries to get their projects off the ground themselves and get them out into the world so without further ado this first episode i had the luxury the pleasure of chatting with a brilliant independent creator keely cope suddeth who is a two-time tribeca film festival selectee and she has all kinds of knowledge bombs that I know will inspire you on your independent filmmaking journey. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Keely. So yay, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Keely Coop Suddeth, correct? I, did I say that correct? It's Cope, but I really don't care. It oh, looks oh, like oh. Coop, so Keely Cope Suddeth, but whatever. <laughs> okay, good to know. I'm, I'm glad I know now. Um, Awesome. Thank you so much. So I know you because I knew your husband, Micah, through the stand-up comedy community. And um, you guys were doing your first project, your first independent project, Home, which was a fantastic web series that I had the luxury of being on the set of. And um, yeah, I just am really inspired by your journey. I, I think you guys, you know, you in particular, like, I mean, both of you, but like, you know, you... Um, created something that was honest and it led you in a bunch of different directions. So I'd love for you to sort of share your story on, you know, when you moved to LA, when you decided this was what you want to do and then what it took to get you started on the independent route on making your own content. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it was so cool connecting with you. I can't believe we made home in 2016. I know, you know, we're coming up on five years ago, time flies. Um, but yeah, so I moved to LA in the summer of 2012 and Mike and I, Micah and I met like two years prior to that in a play in Austin and we really hit it off as creative, like we both, we met in a creative environment. So we naturally really loved collaborating with each other and we always talked about making things together. We didn't have like a plan or anything. We just knew we wanted to go out to LA as actors and we talked about maybe making films together. So when we first got there, I I think I felt, well, first of all, I was very naive, like many people who lived to, who moved to LA. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's gonna be easy. Like, I'll just book something and then book another thing. And you know, I have a degree in acting, so <laughs> they're gonna let me in the door. <laughs> but um, obviously it's like very hard to get in the audition room in LA a and no stat, just side note like I just even saw a stat that like um pretty much like like 4,000 people like actors submit per role pretty much like that's the average yeah number. so yes yeah. insane and I don't know about your experience but I didn't learn like the business side of things I have like a lot of acting training but nobody really taught me how to navigate the industry I actually don't even know if there's any place that really does that honestly um, so I started taking like acting classes and then some improv and storytelling classes and the improv and storytelling really helped me build some confidence in my creative voice and oh what I think is funny and really it kind of broke down the barrier of me feeling like an imposter like I couldn't write because I didn't have a degree in acting it was like the first little pools that I dipped my toes into and I was like oh I did write that and it's it's pretty good and I can explore this. I can do this thing even though I don't have any 
degree in it because what is a degree anyway it's like a piece right of <laughs> so I took some improv and storytelling classes Micah was doing improv and stand-up as well and so we were bo both kind of building confidence in our own voices and we just decided to start making something in our apartment the first thing we actually did was in the summer of 2013 it wasn't narrative but it was a web series called talk and it was like super basic, just conversations that we had in real life um, during our first year of marriage that we thought like, oh, there's something kind of weird or interesting about this. And we had made two friends that were DPs in LA and they're like, let's just shoot it. So we like no budget, just the four of us shot it in our apartment, like paid them in, in food and Trader Joe's crafty and all that good stuff. Um, and then we released that online and it was actually, it ended up being like the first uh, web series that was ever featured by Hello Giggles because oh, cool. I just like randomly submitted it to them and so that project really helped us build our confidence in terms of writing directing and producing something but we did it with a zero budget so that was made in 2013 and then we just started saving anything that we could from our day jobs because Which we knew be inspired by by the way because you both like worked like multiple jobs to save up yeah. your money like I mean and, and I like I mean I just like wanted to stop you to say like to make clear, like, you know, for people listening, like, you know, where to find the money is always, you know, a hard, the hardest part about wanting to yeah. make your own projects. And sometimes, like you said, like 2013 to 2016, that's a three-year gap that you guys were committed to saving, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah. And that's just really, really commendable. And I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> so. Oh, thank you. Well, shout out to Micah, because I will say that I just, I wasn't that financially aware and because he's a little bit older than me and had lived in LA prior to us moving there. He's like, this is going to be worth it. Like we may not know what we're going to make, but let's just prioritize our careers by not like being the couple that goes out on, you know, these weekend trips to Palm Springs that can add up and just really know that we're investing in what we love to do. So it's going to pay off. So shout out Micah for being a great partner and great. <laughs> having that vision for the future. Um, so, so yeah, so then we just for three or four years, just really saved all that we could from our day jobs. And we also kind of were going through some things individually. And as a couple, like Micah's dad got diagnosed with cancer and just that kind of depression being in, 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 Micah's life and also affecting me. We didn't really write for a couple years. We were just kind of on the couch watching things and watching other independent filmmakers and just, you know, success leaves clues. So just like noticing not only what genres uh, we were really interested in and wanted to make our next project in, but also what other independent filmmakers did and, um, how we could do that on our own with like whatever we were able to save. So we watched like a lot of the Duplass Brothers stuff, like Greta Gerwig. Um, yeah, we watched like Issa Rae and all of these people just like making things that were authentically them. And especially in the dramedy genre, which we're drawn to because we love comedy and we love like commenting on the really heavy stuff. It just, it, it's, it's so healing to be able to laugh through the pain. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So we were like studying these, these things for a few years and then um, we wrote home. And I would say home was probably like the ninth or 10th iteration of the story we were trying to figure out we wanted to tell. And we knew we wanted to play versions of ourselves and um, kind of explore this outsider feeling of moving to LA as like a young married couple from the South because nobody's married in LA. Yeah. And also like, how do you make friends as an adult? It's not what we landed on isn't necessarily like the most original story, but it was, it was like a universal theme that we then decided to add all the specifics of our life to. And it ended well. And I think like, that's the thing too, you know, like a lot of times um, when people, especially like, you know, writers struggle to come up with like really original ideas. Mm. And the truth is, is that like, as long as it resonates, oftentimes it's the way you tell it. Like, cause I mean, storytelling is like the same recycled stories over and over again. Yeah. But like just adding your personal lens really, um, you know, gives it that extra thing that can make, that makes it originally yours that it's nobody else's, you know? 
Yeah, exactly. Like there are like there are no new ideas, whatever that saying is. That's true. Like we we're humans. We've all been telling like we all have a similar, even though our the specifics of our lives are different, we're all on a similar journey of experiencing these like new stages and these losses, the, the, these periods of growth and change or whatever. So I think through, you know, the work we had done in classes through improv and storytelling and just writing a lot of different versions, we were able to land on something that we really liked. And I think that's the most important thing is to make something, especially at the independent level when you're a first time filmmaker, like not to focus on trying to fabricate something that somebody else made successful, but really what is making you and your friends laugh? Like what's, what brings you the most joy? Because you can't control the outcome of the response or the release or anything. All you can control is if you're making something that at the end of the day, you're proud of. Yeah, exactly. That's everything. I, I, I love how you just put that because I think that's um, a lesson that unfortunately when people are first getting started, they're so caught up on like, you know, people are really into these ideas or these and, and they make stuff for the audience. And that is always going to leave you just feeling empty inside, especially if it's not received, you know, but like yeah. if you have something that is like honest and feels good and feels like a good representation of, um, you know, if, I mean, if it's just, it's a cathartic experience, any sort of, you know, cr creative thing that you, cr you know, are involved in from the beginning to the end that you see out through to fr fruition. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I, I love that you said that and you said it perfectly. Um, that that's the best way. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I definitely think it's like one of the biggest things that we learned by watching other people is like the projects that stick with us and that we really remember aren't necessarily the ones that got the most views or won the most awards or even like were successful in terms of release or box office or whatever. It's really like projects that the creators were able to be authentically themselves and honest and clearly enjoyed what they were doing. Yes. Um, those are the things that stick with me. And so that's what we tried to do. And with home, we were pleasantly surprised. Like we, we, our goal with home was to make something that we wrote, directed and started and essentially show ran because it's, it, it's a show, it's a narrative series. And it's 85 minutes bro uh, broken down into six episodes. Which is essentially a feature film. Do you, you know what I mean? Like you <laughs> did a feature film, but, and, and it, what's even more impressive, do you mind sharing the budget? Just because I think you, it's so impressive for what the budget was. Oh but yeah, no, I don't yeah. mind. Our goal was to spend what we had saved up, which ended being like $28,000. And of course, as with anything, we want a bit over. So I think total, including um, film festival submissions was like $32,000. Okay, yeah. Um, so post and, and film festivals. So that is like a lot of money in terms of your savings. And there is a, we are privileged in the sense that like we didn't have student loan debt. I had a little bit after college, but we were able to pay it off. So we didn't have like this looming debt hanging over us, which is just really a privilege. And we were really fortunate for that. But we also tried to be as disciplined as we could with saving and having that long-term vision, even when we didn't necessarily have the plan or know the outcome. And people told us we were crazy like yeah, family yeah. and friends Great. included. Because, you, know? <laughs> you know, you think about Texas and it's like, you know, $32,000 is like a down payment on a house in Texas. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, it's, but an artist, like anyone who wants to do this, like that's all we want to do. Like, that's all I want to do with my money is make more stuff. Right, you know? yeah. Um, yeah. But how scary to be a young married couple. And especially when you look at the theme of, of that series, you know, one of the big things is, is yeah, I'm not going to spoil it for listeners who are going to check it out. But one of the things is like, you know, starting a family, right? Like, and the perception and, and sort of what's, what's expected out of a married couple. And, um, you know, especially it's hard in LA to do such a thing, you know, to mm -hmm. start a family here, especially when you are pursuing the arts and aren't just, you know, on a particular career path, that's a little more stable and consistent. Um, but you know, like that's one of the things that you guys explore in the series and 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 like just how scary to think like, oh my gosh, this just took up like several years to save up this money mm -hmm. and we're putting it into this. And like, like, I mean, was, how did that feel? Oh my God, it was so scary. Yeah. So scary throughout the whole process. And even now we look back and we're like, 
you know, visiting Texas and you get curious, you look on Zillow and it's like, damn, well, at this point, things are getting really expensive in Austin, but in Austin, but prior to that, we could have potentially, we could have a house and that's just a different life and a different value. Like we're a creative couple and we just, that was a part of like us committing to each other was like, we're not only committed to each other, but we're committed to each other's dreams. And so we were able to take this really big leap together, but yeah, no, it was fucking terrifying (laughs) and so stressful as I'm, yeah, as you know, like there's so much on the line and you're wearing so many different hats as you have to do when you're making something with that small of a budget, which is crazy that it's small, but it is tiny when you think about the things actually you know, get made in Hollywood. Um, To us, it was huge, but in the grand scheme of things, very small amount, but the stakes were so high Mm -hmm. that every day it was just like a battle, not like from every step from pre-production to production to post of like fighting these demons that are like, what the hell are you doing? Like you're being so stupid. You're, you're spending all of your money on something that nobody told you to do. Actually, a, a bunch of people questioned you know, this type of risk. And we are first time filmmakers. We're directing something that we're also in, um, but, you know, doing everything from crafty to, to casting, to producing, to might get edited and all of that. Um, but you guys was, learned, I'm sure that I'm, it's like film school in, you know, in, in a project. Absolutely. And that's, and that's really what, why it was so valuable. And I, that's a big piece of advice that I give to other um, actors or creators who are wanting to make their first project. We really took it seriously and um, it was a huge investment, but I think that at the end of the day, to me, it's almost more valuable. It is more valuable at this point than spending money on classes because we walked away with a full project that we'll have forever. That you were and, in every aspect of. So now you've got yeah. director's reels and you know what I mean? Like, and, yeah. I mean, and it was just impressive because, you know, you hadn't written, you know, you, you said that you guys had written, but not, you know, you hadn't ever like, you worried because you weren't like a trained writer, but like right. the writing was really strong. And I just like, really think that that's so great that you, you know, trusted what was authentic to you and Micah and, you know, your sort of personalities and, you know, the themes that resonate with you guys and are important to you guys that you are interested in exploring because it resulted in really strong writing. Like, I remember when I read those scripts Mm -hmm. initially, I'm just like, I mean, this is like really strong, like really strong. Oh, (laughs) wow. Thank (laughs) you. Well, I think that's like a secret weapon of actors or really anyone who's watched a lot of films, but especially actors, because you're reading it from the perspective of, do I, like, are these lines human? Do I want to be this character or is it, does it not feel real? So I think just because we've both been acting um, since we were kids, we just always knew like what was good dialogue, what felt true to say and what didn't. So I think that was an extra weapon. We also did a lot of readings prior to shooting, which really helped us kind of finesse the moments that weren't working. And we um, had people read our roles so we could just hear and kind of hear Um, not only other actors interpretations but just it's so important to get that outside perspective if you are going to be a multi-hyphenate and write direct and act in it Uh because you can kind of you just need to take it in prior to and really prep and pre-production because when when you're going like when we're shooting you don't have time to like pause and and rewrite it and and figure yeah. it out. Like, oh, you know what? By the way, I never really liked this. Is there like a yeah. fix? That would, why didn't you say that before? You like, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I I think that's invaluable information. Also, um, getting feedback from your peers, people that you trust, um, yeah. so that everybody's on the same page. Because yeah, especially if you're in front of the camera when you're trying to direct, it's things can get lost if everybody's not on the same page. So absolutely. And we got that idea of doing a bunch of readings before and like paying our friends in pizza from Mike Birbiglia. I listened to a podcast he was on where he was talking about, I think his films don't think twice. Yeah, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was talking about that process and doing readings with friends. And that's when we were like, oh yeah, we should really do that. So I think we ended up doing three or four before we shot, which was awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And then, so when you, so you obviously, um, 
but people listening, not obviously, you you had a great outcome with that because you guys got into tri into Tribeca and this was 2018 Tribeca? 2018, yeah. So we, we shot home December of 2016, did like a year of post and also trying to figure out what we wanted to do because we didn't have the intention of submitting it to festivals. It was, I also wasn't that informed about the amount of festivals that were accepting series and web series and how that's just by nature, um, just a smaller pool because mm -hmm. every film festival has shorts, but not every film festival has series. And also um, a lot of first time filmmakers do make shorts, but not necessarily series. So it's just kind of this pool, smaller pool um, where I think first time filmmakers are able to have their work viewed and considered. And so anyway, long story short, I think we met with another couple who had made one of our favorite web series, it's called The Impossibilities. I don't know if it's online anymore, but we met up with them and got a coffee and they're like, you guys should submit to festivals. And for some reason, like we hadn't thought of that before. <laughs> and so um, we did and submitted to a lot of festivals, got a lot of rejections. And then during like one of the most chaotic times of our life when Micah's dad was actually in a hospital in Tijuana, we found out we got into Tribeca. So it was like one of those moments where it's like moments where it's just like such a beautiful moment but then also such a sad time yeah yeah such I mean that's life right I mean we all know that especially after this last year it's just a paradox of like highs and lows and both and everything happening at the same time but I'll never forget that because I know it also brought Micah's dad a lot of joy and hope because he really believed in our dreams um so it was so surprising yeah. and we were so stoked and um, that was only like one of the great benefits of, of making home because I it also helped us secure management that we have now and introduced us to the screenwriter that we're collaborating with. So it really paid off like in so many different ways, but at the same time, like not financially, you know? Right, right. So it's a it an investment, you know? Yeah, yeah, it was an investment. Yeah, because a lot of people do spend that kind of money on like film school. Like that's a, almost the same amount as like Los Angeles film school, like LA film yeah. school. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, looking at it in that regard, it's like you guys got something fully made that was that introduced you to people that weren't just other students. You know, they were working professionals, got you management, and it's led to some jobs. I know you guys, yeah, you guys have directed a couple things, right? Um, yeah, we directed a whole season of a series for Brat TV, this like really big YouTube channel, which yeah. was awesome because whereas our indie work doesn't get that many views, we can now say like we've gotten over 6 million views on a series that we directed. And that was so cool because it was like film school 2.0, like we were on a way bigger set. We had a bigger budget. We had like people in every role. We didn't have to do everything. We right. could just direct. It was crazy. And also it was a great experience because it wasn't a personal passion project, which as you know, you care so much that it, if the stakes are so high and stressful, we were really able to just focus on um, building our strengths as directors. So we, we couldn't have done that without home. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that's that's super, super rad. And um, and so from there, you guys have continued to um, produce your own content. You started a new series, um, Backsliders. Yeah, um, which I watched um, the the links that you sent me and I've seen like clips throughout the the ones that are released, like through yeah. um, Instagram and stuff. I'll click on your on your videos when you post them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I would love to I definitely it's excellent and this was also a Tribeca pick yes and that was last in, yeah so technically it was a Tribeca 2020 selection but we that was obviously postponed last year so but they're super awesome and they're doing they're including us in this 20th anniversary year in 2021 so we'll be premiering our episodes there uh June 20th oh cool exciting yeah, yeah. thanks yeah so with um and so backsliders is um the the theme of that is is sort of like sliding back into you know sort of bad not necessarily bad but like patterns and things that we we've we think we've we've grown out of right is that sort of the concept yeah that's definitely one of the major themes and this project particularly explores like our conservative religious beliefs 
that we were indoctrinated with that we don't necessarily carry with us anymore, but there's still some lingering shame and guilt about totally normal human stuff <laughs> that we wanted to explore through a comedic lens. Um, I love it. I, I love how you, I love the things you tackled in it. Was that, um, you know, there, cause there are some heavy religious I mean, exactly what you just described is, is sort of what the series embodies is like, you know, the ways in which those um, things that you're taught at such a young age creep out in your adult mm -hmm. life and affect you um, as an adult in a marriage even. And so like, what was that? What was, how did you guys come? Like, was it just something where you were like, I feel like we both sort of had this experience. I'd love to explore this or like, where did the inception for the idea come and, and how did it all unfold? That's a great question. Uh, Cause I, it, there, for this project, there was actually a specific moment. Um, I think, you know, Micah and I have always pulled from our own lives and there's a little bit of our religious stuff in home, but it's like really commented on in like a scene or two. But I think the more years that we've been together and the more therapy we've done, we've really realized like how much we were shaped by our religious beliefs and how much we feel like outsiders now in our families because we're some of the few who have radically changed our beliefs in order to become, you know, who we truly are. And then ask questions even, just even that, who are like yeah. Asking questions, yeah. Yeah, to ask questions and to say like, I don't know. And, and maybe this religion that we were told is the only true and right religion is not because we could have been born on the other side of the world and believe that about a totally Anybody, different yeah. religion. Um, but we were meeting with the our manager right after home had gotten into Tribeca and we were talking about Micah's dad who used to be a pastor. And like I said, he was going through his cancer battle at the time. And while he was going through this cancer experience, he really kind of deconstructed, this is like a a new term that people are throwing around in this like ex-evangelical former Christian space, which I love the word, but it's it's used a lot. So people from that community roll their eyes at it at this point. I think it's a really great word because totally, totally. that's what it is. It's like, it's taking apart this belief system and then figuring out like what you want to keep and then what does more harm than good. So he was kind of going through that process. I think as he was facing the prospect of death and he and Micah were having a lot more honest, like spiritual conversations that they never had when he was a kid. Cause his dad was like a pastor, like mm -hmm. the person who had the answers and Micah would sometimes have questions and it would almost seem like those weren't welcomed at that time. But so he had this whole like uh, faith transformation and really became way more open and we were really both moved by that. And it was just like a topic that we kept talking about. And we were telling our manager the story about uh, Micah's dad. And he was like, it seems like you guys want to make a project about this, like about faith and about God. And maybe the title is God question mark. And we we're like, no, that's probably not the title, but, <laughs> but uh, you're right. Like we, we do have this like unique background coming from places that were very religious and being able to know people who are very conservative and religious and love them, but also be able to question and comment on things that we can see are really harmful beliefs and do it in like a funny and subversive way, just because that's like who we are. So that conversation kind of kicked us off developing Backsliders, what became a web series, but what we did first was uh, we saved up a little bit of money and made a short film and that I think was the first episode that you watched. That's what we call like the prequel because our characters are like earlier on in their exploration or really comfortability with being themselves around each other and rewriting some of the harmful religious stories. Um, we made that as a short, uh, actually submitted it to a bunch of festivals, didn't get in anywhere, but we knew we wanted to keep developing this idea. And all of this was like leading towards us trying to figure out what half hour show we wanted to write because we knew we wanted to write a pilot. So we just decided to, I think this, yeah, this was 2019. I think we shot four weekends that year, like one or two day shoots. And we tried to shoot um, two to four episodes a uh, shoot day. 
And with this project, it was way looser than home, which we were putting way more money in, which we shot at different locations. Backsliders, we shot all of it at our house. We had like a two to four person crew and the scripts were like one to four pages. And then our goal was to try to see how much improv we could bring back in. So we like wrote essentially a detailed outline and then kind of threw it away on the day and just found what felt more natural for us, which ended up with some like funny and surprising stuff even for us. So we ended up having, now we have like 13 episodes, including that short. Um, and then we submitted it again and Tribeca accepted it as a web series. And we were thrilled with that because really all of it was just development of this larger idea. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like the backsliders journey. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I love it. Um, it's really excellent. And and I mean, everything that you guys do is great. I, I'm in the same camp as you in terms of like dramedies, like, you know, comedy mm -hmm. dramas, like really um, like uh, Miranda July is one of my favorite filmmakers. Like I just love yeah. everything she does, you know. Um, and you mentioned the Duplass brothers, of course. Um, Jeff who lives at home is just like one of my favorites. <laughs> you just feel like yeah. it's so good. Um, but yeah, like, uh, so I love everything you guys do because there is a realness, there is a groundedness to it. Um, now, the the thing that's so interesting is that, you know, you and Micah are married and you've been married for how many years? Oh my God, uh, eight. Eight, eight, yeah, eight years. It, so it's so nice. That, you know, like, and how is that like striking that balance when you're working so closely with someone and so intimately with someone creatively, like how mm -hmm. do you set the balance in terms of not only your relationship, but then keeping it um, when you do work together, making it so that, you know, the relationship doesn't get fractured or, you know what I mean? That other stuff mm -hmm. doesn't keep in, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a great question. And <laughs> I don't know if I have an exact answer. Like, I do think that's one of the greatest struggles of our relationship is that we're so intertwined, not only like with what we do for our jobs, but creatively. And it can be very hard. I'm a very sensitive woman. And Micah's very, like, especially when we're working, like, brutally honest and direct to the point. And so sometimes we get a little heated <laughs> and we've just learned, like, okay, we're going to, like, step away from the crew for 10 minutes and just, like, hash it out. That's just our communication style. We're very open and honest and direct with each other. We're not afraid to, like, show our anger with each other because we really trust each other and are safe with each other. But, uh, we can get really pissed off at each other. Sure. I mean, because I mean, tensions are so high when you're creating something because you are like, I mean, this is a life form, you know, like mm -hmm. you are creating a, a little, a, a mini life, a world that exists. And, um, you know, it's hard for, you know, it's hard for one person, you know, to, to get their, their vision across, let alone like two people to be on the same page at all times. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'll say, I don't know. I feel like we're constantly learning and relearning like how to work together. But I also feel that way, like personally about every creative project, every script I work on, I feel like I'm relearning how to write. It's just, it's always new and challenging in different ways, but that's how I feel about us working together. Home was probably the most challenging because it just thus far in our careers, there was the most on the line. We were like the least experience we'd ever been. Everything was the first time. And we were wearing so many hats and, and had to move so quickly. Like we were shooting like, I think eight to 10 pages a day did not have a lot of time. And so we just had to like recover quickly from yeah. whatever mm -hmm. came up on the day. And you know, you're, you're making something, shit's gonna go wrong and it's not necessarily personal. We there was a locked learn. door at the lawyer, you know, one of the locations. Remember that? Oh my God. Yeah. Yes. We got locked out of a room. I, it was crazy. Like all the equipment or something was in there. Yes. Like, yeah. And uh -huh. so we couldn't leave the location until we could get in that room. Yes. Um, you know, like, and, and, and when you're shooting, like you said, eight to 10 pages a day and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, it, that stuff, it, it carries so much more stress and tension than, than it would, you know, when you've got the time to loiter around, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, so that's, that's all, that's, I, I love all of that. Um, and in terms of like, 
you know, you guys work together. Do you ever think to yourself like, oh, I, I want to try doing something on my own or like, do either of you ever talk about that or? Yeah, we talk about it. And I think we're both interested right now. We're working on a couple projects with a, a third writer, um, which is the first time we've ever done that. And that's been a unique challenge and also cool and really teaching us how to take things less personally and to just like witness that inherently being true with someone else. And it's like, can we practice more of that, even though it's impossible to, to truly be neutral when you're married. Right. <laughs> and right. so you care what the other person thinks, but that's really taught us a lot. I, I think we're both absolutely interested in writing and collaborating with other people. We just so far, it's just such an asset to essentially have like a writing, like a writer's room yeah. just at home with the two of us. So even when I feel like if and when we venture out and write things on our own, we'll always be like the person that the other person is, is getting notes from. So yeah. um, at this point, it's like, it only makes sense to share credits, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I mean, just cause you know, like um, with like the Duplass brothers, like they all yeah. put everything together. And then eventually it was like, I do kind of want to do this one on my own. I do kind of, you know, cause it's yeah. important, you know, as we go, but you guys are a great team. So I can also understand where it's like, we'll see, but right now we're, we're going. Yeah, we're in a groove. Yeah. I think, you know, it, it, like you said, it like also depends on the project too. You know, there, I do want to, I want to write a feature about like my childhood and I know like I'll own that more, way more because I'm like writing my life. But I also know that like Micah will be the first person that I get notes from. So um, yeah, it just depends. Luckily, so far we like working with each other. We yeah. Love, hate is, is what we always say, but more love than hate. <laughs> Absolutely. When you do, because, you know, it's like, um, you know, I, I'm married to an actor and um, and she's an excellent writer, an excellent, yeah. like such a good, like some, I, I, like I'm like, if you could finish something, like I feel like it, like it would just knock the socks off of the world. Like really, like she's so good because I think when you act, um, you know, you just, you interpret as, as you're coming from a place of honesty when you read it, when you yeah. pick up the script and read it. And so, I mean, she can smell bullshit a mile away. She picks up a scene and she's like, it's trash, you know? <laughs> when yeah. she writes, it's incredible. and. Um, but we've tried writing together before and, and some stuff we've been able to, you know, we, we did a branded, a narrative branded series together. That was a lot of fun, um, for like a startup company, but, but it, larger projects that we, ca that that's not like that we're more invested in, in terms of the actual story and the actual project. Um, you know, we, we definitely like, we see how difficult it can be to write because together, mm -hmm. Um, cause we'll, you know, trade scenes back and forth or, you know, and we just find like, oh, I think we're envisioning two totally different projects. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Like, stuff that becomes clear. So when you guys like, is, is one of you, are one of you, the one who's like, let's sit down and write, like, do you guys really commit to a schedule? Like, how do you go about uh. that work? <laughs> yeah. I wish it's definitely something that I, I really would like to have a better habit of is like more of a schedule and, and writing routine and be more disciplined in that way. But um, in terms of how we write together, I'm naturally like the overwriter, like first draft, let's just like get it out on the page, messy, like fuck around and find out kind of style. And Micah really, he has like more of the editor's like technical brain. So he, naturally just writes slower because he's like wanting what he writes to he's editing good. It in his mind yes. yeah yeah he's already doing that so we have like different strengths but what we'll do is like we collect our ideas on like note cards um we'll like solidify the theme and then just like by ideas I mean like random bits of dialogue, like scenes, situation, characters, anything. Just like gather everything we can as we're like trying to figure out what project we're building. We'll put all of that on the board, see if there's a story there. And then we will start the process of outlining. And like I said, like Micah wants to spend way more time doing this than I do because I wanna just like go ahead and get a first draft going. But there really is a benefit to being more strategic with the outline and then once you're very happy with the outline, like writing the script is pretty easy. We do kind of like what you guys were talking about, like the scenes back and forth. But I think because we spend so much time like 
really weighing the decisions of the outline that the scene trading goes a little smoother because we'd already like made a lot of those choices. Right. We do get in a lot of fights <laughs> when we're like reading scripts and like you really love something and you know the other person really hates it and you're like that was amazing <laughs> like that was my favorite part and that's the only note that you have is that like that's trash. Sometimes you, people are just like on different pages. Yeah. Um, so we get we both get our feelings hurt, but at the end of the day, like how we recover is we have the same goal. Like we both want this to be as good as it can be. So we are not like trying to hurt each other. We're both just trying to make this thing as yeah, awesome. absolutely. Because I mean, I I write with a writing partner, um, and we met as we met professionally, and so it's that thing where like. Um, you know, now having written three features together, we definitely, you know, we'll get in a little more like uh, our relationship is more intimate where we will be a lot mm. more blunt and a lot more um, upfront and, and probably hurt feelings when we don't mean to. But it's yeah. that, that same thing where it's like you, you have a, um, I mean, you just said it really well, like when you both want something to be good, but like some, and sometimes it's just communication, like um, sometimes I feel like I will see something very clearly and I'll be like, no, this, you know, like, I don't think that character should do that. The thing that she did here is enough. Like, I feel like if she mm. goes and does this, it just doesn't, I just feel like it makes us not at all like her. It feels like such a backstab, whereas the other, you know what I mean? And then, and he's just, will like argue for it. And then he'll come around and he'll be like, oh, I see what you're saying. We all, we can still use this part. And I'm like, yes, you know, but yeah. like, sometimes it's that communication where he thinks I'm taking down the whole idea. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm saying, let's cling to this motivation because the other one, we yeah. can do the whole thing, you know? So, um, sometimes like, I mean, that's really just it. Like, it's, it's, it's such an interesting experience creating, um, a f like anything like this because it is a whole entire world, you know? I mean, it just, it yeah. is, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I relate a lot to what you're saying. It, it sometimes like, we'll, I feel like we both, it just depends on the day. Like we'll have that kind of like communication mishap or like argument and then at the end of the day, the other person will be like, oh, or, or they'll come around to the idea on their own. I think that's just like a part of being humans. I don't know. Like it's happened so much that we both now can see it's a pattern and it's just like the way it is. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think it's that thing of like someone plants a seed, like you don't mm -hmm. see it yet. And then like, yeah, you know, it's chilling and then it grows and you're like, oh, I see. I get it now. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it takes time. And we all have different brains and like what we don't even understand how brains work. You know, like we're all trying to work through, like you said, building an entire world there. It's so much. And no wonder it takes like different people a different timeline to like come around to what the right idea is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that. Um, and so as far as like, because, you know, I mean, I love that you guys, you guys work with really talented people. You've sort of kept like, you know, once you, once you found like your core, you know, crew, mm. it, like, are you guys, do you, I, I saw, I remember you posted one time online that you were committing like you know, to like spend a couple hours every week or every month or something on learning the camera, learning cinematography. Mm. Is that still something that you're, that you're doing so that you can be, you know, become more um, technically savvy in terms of directing or what is your, like, do you, are you doing that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll say like, it wasn't like a new year's resolution that we stuck to, like, it's not like we got like a thousand hours that year. Um, but we did have a few really great days with our DP. When we were shooting Backsliders, actually on those two day weekends, we tried to keep one of the days for us just learning more about the camera with him. I will say that I still feel like I need years, years more before I maybe feel like I have the confidence enough to, to show what I would shoot. Right. <laughs> um, but that is something that we talk about. We talk about just how cool it would be to make an experimental project where we film each other, you know, where we're the DPs. But um, shout out to our awesome director of photography, Dan Finlayson, because he's just so brilliant and so smart about lighting and the camera. Like you could talk to him for hours and hours and hours and he wouldn't run out of things to tell you. And he's just got such an excitement and a passion for the camera 
Yeah. Really, his eye is definitely great because yeah. you know what he, and it, obviously it seems like you guys um, speak the same language because he was able to capture you guys in a way that felt authentic. And of course you guys were directing. And so, you know, um, you, what you, you know, led him to was great, but um, you know, there's no way it would have been that good if he wasn't on the same page or didn't speak your language. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're like, we're like a triangle, like we all needed each other. Um, we, we need each other on every project. I, I know there are some directors who went to film school and are maybe more like technically astute than the two of us are. We're coming from like the creative actor story um, side more than the visual side, though we're trying to both grow those strengths. But Dan was, he's essential because he like, he's our strength and our weakness. And we are all, we all have this desire to make something that's as beautiful and as true to the story as we can with whatever resources we <laughs> happen to be able to get for yeah. each project. Um, so it's just like this really great friendship that we have. You know, he's one of our dearest friends now. And I think because like, it's a very intimate relationship. It's collaborative. Yeah. It's creating something new and, and problem solving so many different things. Uh, we could not do it without him. <laughs> yeah, and he's, I mean, and he's also entering a situation where he's like the middleman. And so, uh, oh and my so God. Capacity, I'm sure, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he knows us like very well. I think like he was kind of shocked at first. We did meet with him a lot before, prior to shooting home. And Micah met Dan on a short film set where Dan was the DP for one of our other friends where Micah was acting in the project. So he was able to watch him work and see how much he cares and like what a great communicator he is and just how, what a professional he is, how he treats every set like a professional and really tries to bring his A game to it. So we met a lot with Dan prior to making home to make sure we were all like on the same page creatively. And I think just him hanging out with us, he kind of got a gist for the type of couple me and Micah are and how there's a brutal honesty there, which is probably going to come out more and more on set. But now we've made so many things together. Like, I don't think he's phased at all. He just like knows, yeah, okay, like yes. they're fine. They're going to recover. They just might like say some shit to each other that no other people should say. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. And I think any relationship, I'm, I'm writing something right now that's that same type of thing. Like it's, uh, you know, a couple doing something. And, and um, obviously if I say what they're doing, then it gives them a <laughs> but. Yes, you, it's that, it's that, di it's the thing of, you know, the intimacies of a relationship like that. Um, of course, stuff's going to come out that, that no one should say to each other. Yeah. Being. But then, yeah. you know, I, I think that's, that's great that you've got, which reminds me actually, um, I was going to say that you've got Dan, which reminds me because um, you guys invested in a camera, like your own camera, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'd love, like, share about that and what made you, like, because it's it's a nice camera, it's an expensive thing, and so I would just love to hear the decision. Was it worth it? And what you got, do you guys run it out? Like, tell me the whole spiel on that. Yeah, so, gosh, what year was that? I think it was 2018. Um, we threw Dan, I think, um, we had been curious about like how much it would cost to get a camera. And really we were just thinking like, how can we make our lives the most set up to make things when we're ready to make them? Like, can we limit the obstacles in our way to be able to shoot something like next month if we have something ready? Which is exactly so have, what every independent filmmaker listening needs to. This is the mindset <laughs> we need to have. So go ahead, keep going. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like take yourself that seriously and be like, I mean, there's the Duplass Brothers method, which is like make a $5 movie. And at this point, you know, we are we, prior to the pandemic, uh, prior to unemployment and all of that good stuff from yes. this chaotic last year, we did have a day job situation where we had some consistent income. We still had a really good habit of saving and um, Dan, I think Dan came to Micah, he had heard that a woman in Florida, I don't really know, he, Micah would be a better uh, storyteller of this particular incident, but we learned of a woman in Florida who was selling an Alexa, which was the, um, the camera that we made home on. We rented that camera and we loved it. It's, it's beautiful, cinematic. And it colors so well. 
what you yeah. can do with color grading with that camera is so great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it can make, it, it can just make your footage, even if you're like us and you're not spending that much, it can really make it look like you had a, a great budget. Um, it, there's like also what you can do in, in color and post is like have this awesome grainy like film quality, just the, the camera naturally has more of that quality itself. So it's just an addition to that. And we really like that look. Um, and Dan loves it and is very familiar with it, that camera. So we learned that she was selling it and it was like just sitting in this place in Florida. It has like a low amount of hours on it. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was essentially like this awesome car sitting, just sitting in a garage, not being used with not a lot of miles on it. And so we decided it was there, it was being sold, I think for like nine or 10 K. And so we had been saving up and just decided if spending this money is going to make it easier for us to make more projects this year. It's like a worthy investment. Mm -hmm. We were able to like get the camera checked out and make sure that it was all good and everything. So we ended up purchasing it and that's what we made backsliders with. Um, and it has gone out to rent a couple times, but it's not like, I think when we first got it, we assumed that maybe it would be able to be rented out more and we could get a little bit money, a little bit of our investment back, but that didn't necessarily come true, but it helped us make this project. We still have it. It's about to go out, um, I think like next month. So that's good. Hopefully it goes out a little bit more, but really what it did was help. I don't think we would have made backsliders in the 13 episodes that we ended up with if we didn't have that in our house. <laughs> yeah, sure. I can. Yeah. Because I mean, that is part of the, it, it's part of the thing when you start, you start thinking like, oh, let's, you know, this is nothing. It's just us in our house. But then you think like, mm -hmm. okay, sound. And then you think like, mm -hmm. okay. And then, you know, a couple, you know, a couple lights, camera, DP, you know, suddenly it's a grand a day, you yeah. know, or, and it's it, real it, quick, real quick, <laughs> real quick. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think, I think that was, that was great. I, um, I got my hands on a, I, I'm learning black magic. So I have, you know, one of the pocket cameras that I'm learning, but I, I just think it's great to have it here because I'm like, um, you know, getting to experiment myself and getting to learn. And, and I, and I just feel like it is something that nowadays, if you do want to make your own films, like having access like that enables you to play around at home and, and, you know, just find, things that you want to tell stories about. And then that helps you with editing and it helps you practice all the different, all the yeah. different aspects. Yeah, so, absolutely. And yeah. I think it also provides like, oh, what's the word? It kind of provides an accountability, right? Like our cameras in our closet right now. So I think it's just a way to design your life around what you want to do. And like, you have this equipment in your house, you see it every day, you're reminded of like, all these days that you spend at your computer trying to come up with the right lines and the right ideas and all the times you want to give up there's like a physical reminder of like you're going to make something like you're going to be on set with your friends and it will be worth it um, yeah and i spent money on this like i'm gonna yeah. i'm not gonna let this just go to waste like i'm using exactly it. Yeah. yeah yeah like i this is an investment like i take myself and my art seriously yeah it's yep. worth it I love that. I love that you even just said that I take myself and my art seriously, because that's yeah. exactly how you have to take it. So, yeah. um, yeah. Cause nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to take your career more seriously than you are. Nobody, nobody gives a fuck. Honestly, like nobody cares if you make that thing or if you don't make that thing, nobody cares if you take, you know, this idea that you have in your head and do something with it, or it just sits on the shelf. Nobody cares yeah. unless you do. And so like, I think it's so important to do whatever means you have to be able to invest in yourself, whatever that is, even if it's just like buying a lens for your iPhone or like buying a new iPhone, a new iPhone. Yeah, amazing. totally, totally. I totally did get some lenses and some, you know, gimbals and that kind of things. And I did shoot two shorts on my iPhone just to try it, um, yeah. you know, during uh, the pandemic. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's. That's awesome. Yeah. And we've got that now that, that equipment and, and, you know, that you can, you know, you can have an editing bay at home, you can edit on your laptop, you, you know, like it's um, there's no reason to say, to not do it anymore. There's no reason, mm -hmm. you know, there's no excuses. <laughs> yeah. Cause there's always a way. And even if, yeah, even if you are just making something on your phone or whatever means you have, however you make it, if you just 
make it, you will have gained something from it. Yeah. Even if it's just like, oh, that one line or that one moment was amazing. So then you have like the new bud of a different project that maybe you can spend more time and resources on, but you'll always improve as an artist and a filmmaker if you just figure out how to get the obstacles that are in your way and preventing you from making something out of the way so that you can make something however big or small it is. It'll make you grow. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. Removing the obstacles. I love that. Just remove the obstacles. Like yeah. it's always an excuse. There's always like, well, I don't have the money. Okay. Well, what mm-hmm. do you have? Um, right. I, I'm an actor and I have a phone and I do have this silly idea. I don't know. It seems stupid. Well, I mean, it might not be stupid. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. won't know unless you try it, you know, exactly. phone, yeah. you're an actor. Let's do it. So, yeah. 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 And you're right. Like you just said earlier, you know, it's like 2021 in this day and age, you can figure out a way to make something you really don't, you can do it yourself. Even, I mean, like people are doing shit on TikTok and whatnot, whatever. I mean, I know there are different levels of creating and filmmaking, but if you have that desire to express yourself creatively through filmmaking or whatever kind of storytelling genre you're interested in, you can figure out a way to do it. I think the biggest thing is just like, getting over that like imposter syndrome, like who am I to take myself or my art seriously? Like who cares? But if you have that desire within you, I think it's so important to honor that and to realize that you can figure out a way. People have, and um, one of my favorite quotes, like I said earlier, is success leaves clues. Like you have YouTube too. You can literally go and listen to hundreds and hundreds and hours of interviews of filmmakers who made something in their home and see what they did. And then just like, yeah, do that. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, I, I, I had never read rebel without a crew until mm. Robert Rodriguez until this year. Um, and it inspired me greatly. And it's like almost 30 years later, you know, and I've already made a feature film, but even just reading his, I'm just like, see, this is how I wanted to do it the first time. But then I let yeah. other people <laughs> come in and I compromised on this, that, and the other and whatever. But, um, you know, there, there's all kinds of, of these stories now. And yes, like there's only a handful of people who are like, you know, Robert Rodriguez and Richard Linklater and, um, you know, even Lena Dunham, like there's only a handful of people who've made a really small budget movie and had it go on to lead to astronomical success. But, right. you know, that should never be the, you know, the reason behind the motivation to make the film anyway. Like if, if mm-hmm. you're looking to make, a million dollars, you know, off of a $50,000 movie, like that's not going to, you know, the chances right. of that, uh, but if you just want to, but if you have an idea and you want to make it and you're compelled to tell the story, yeah. that's possible and just make it as good as you can and show mm-hmm. people that you cared enough to bring it to life. And hopefully it'll open. I mean, it'll change your life regardless, you know, I, I, I totally agree. That. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because then you're just empowered to know that you can create something. And at the end of the day, especially if you're coming at it, I think as any artist, you know, one of the biggest things to overcome is just this feeling of powerlessness, especially as an actor, where you're like, I have this skill set, but nobody's calling me to use it. So I'm just kind of waiting around for somebody to give me an audition or like keep knocking on the doors and this desperation builds because you have this gift that you want to use but you don't have a means or a way to use it. But now hopefully more and more people are learning and seeing all these examples of there are so many different ways to figure out how to make something. And like you said, like you can't control the outcome and whether or not you'll get your money back or get those views or whatever, but you will have been changed as a person because you will have taken something that existed in your brain, brought it to life and used the skills that you had to do it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I had a, um, I was at a Labor Day party a few years ago and I'd um, gotten a little stoned and I watched this whole (laughs) experience unfold with this pasta salad. Like I I watched this um, like beginning, middle and end. And so I'm like, that that could be a short film. And I just off of this dish that somebody made and I wrote it and I, you know, I, my, I, I shot it at my house for no money, you know, no budget, the yeah, product value yeah. is super low, um, super, super low. But the whole goal was to, um, see if I, you know, to see if I could make something for nothing. And mm-hmm. I wanted to see how I could pull off this ridiculous tone and, you, you know, whatever. Um, 
but I got something for, and I get so much joy out of it. Like, even though it's, even though the production value is really low and there's things that I wanted differently and all kinds of different things, you know, we were losing light at the end of the day. So there's all these, um, what it could have should us and right. uh, fish, but it still is just, there's so much joy that comes from it. You know, yeah. I, my friends, um, I have this really funny friend. I told her, I was like, I want to play around with my camera. I have an idea for, um, you know, basically somebody's the, the, the emotional journey of, of, releasing something on social media of wanting that mm. you know, outside validation. So it's called the algorithm. And I, I went to her house. We, we didn't have lights or anything. I didn't bring them because I just wanted to play with the camera. Mm. And I just wrote down the emotional beats and we made sure that, and she improved the whole thing, but we wrote down the emotional beats and, you know, I know her so well that I was able to pull out a lot of great stuff and amplify certain things. Mm. Um, but what resulted was something that I wanted to release because it was so funny and it like, she was so funny in it. And I'm just like, this is the worst production value thing I've ever shot, but I, I love it enough and I crack up enough and it's made so many other people laugh that I got. And people are like, Oh my God, I feel so seen. This is me. This is me. This is me. And so it's like, that's, that's the return, you know, yeah. like having people um, feel seen and us not feeling alone and knowing that you made people enjoy something for a few minutes. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. And you didn't let your fear of imperfection or of making something that's not like, you know, going to get an award for production. Value. Right. You didn't let that fear of judgment, of, you know, criticism of outside people prevent you from bringing this idea to life and yeah. you're automatically rewarded. And the work is rewarding itself. Like I'm that's, sure you had a blast on set with your friends. Blast. Yes. It was the yeah. most fun day. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that's the best. Yeah. Um, I, I love this. I love this chat so much. I, I love every single thing that you said. Um, I, I just, I can't wait to see what you do in the future. What, um, bef like before we head out here, what exactly are you working on now? And um, where can people find all the stuff we've talked about? Yeah, um, working on a couple different things right now, which is really fun because they're um, projects that we are writing to hopefully direct and not be in. So naturally like Micah and I are having a lot of fun just like writing for people and perspectives that aren't ours. Um, it's challenging in a lot of different ways. We're developing two shows right now um, that we hope to go out and pitch. They're both half hour. One is comedy comedy and one's dramedy. Um, and we also wrote a half hour pilot for Backsliders. So that idea of it being a TV show is in development, fingers crossed. And um, what people can watch of ours, we have right now, I think we have seven episodes of our Backsliders web series released. You can go to youtube.com slash Bob Williams Productions. It's like Williams, but with a B because it's a made up name because <laughs> we're a production company where we just make things up. Um, or you can search Backsliders series on YouTube. Uh, you can follow me on social media at Keely Makes on Instagram. Um, you can follow Backsliders on Instagram at Backsliders Show. And I think that's it. Cool. Yeah. And I'll keep, and all these links will be in the, in, um, you know, where I post the podcast as well. But awesome. just like, sometimes if people are just listening and they pick up their phone, they can um, pull it right up. So, yeah. yay. Thank well, you so much. Thank you so much for this. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you for making the time. Have so much fun um, in Texas and um, send my love to Micah. I absolutely will. Thank you so much for having me on. I, I It's a mutual admiration. I think you're such a great independent filmmaker and writer and comic. And so I'm so... I'm so pleased that we met so many years ago. And we're I know, here. totally. And I, I, I love watching your journey. So thank you. Those words mean a lot. Same, well, same. So. Let's keep climbing together. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Have a beautiful day. Thank you so much, Keely. Thanks. Bye. Bye.